Thank you, Father Ari, for inviting me to present this talk, which I, a short version was presented some time ago, but I added about uh, 20 minutes of, of it. But um, to tell you frankly, I really learned a lot while doing this research, which is uh, very new to me also. There. As introduction, uh, this book, the, it's the Philippines' one and only econobulum, meaning a book published before 1500. It was found at the USD archives. The book, um, Joseph Lavius, La Guerra Judaica, was published in 1492, but it was brought from Xiamen to the Philippines as part of the Christian missions to China. So let me first in introduce the contents of my full paper. Uh, some parts which I presented earlier, then I will elaborate on newer uh, information. Okay, the first topic is the crucial role of China and the Chinese in Spanish occupation of the Philippines. As Legaspi emphasized, the Spaniards were looking for a base for China, for the China trade and the spice trade. So it is actually China, not the Philippines per se, that Spain wanted. Important to China now is the One Belt and One Road Initiative, but in early times, the Philippines played a crucial role in the ancient Obor by connecting China to Mexico, to the rest of the world through the Manila Acapulco trade. So um, du during the, the um, uh, Spanish uh, maritime trade, it has a lot of uh, impact on the West because of the, without the maritime trade, there would be no rapid change in Europe, no Western colonial advantage. In fact, no Western colonization. It was because of the maritime trade that started out of Fujian that, uh, trade exchanges happened, spices, silk was exchanged with native goods, raw materials, okay? So um, Spain actually got its great idea of an imperial power from Fujian vis-a-vis the Chinese traders in Luzon. When they arrived in Luzon, they found that it is an important base for Fujian merchants to conduct their trade, uh, bringing silk and brocade, of course. So unable to discover spices and gold in the islands, Spanish authorities at first wanted to abandon the colony, but the priest's persuasion to keep the Philippines as a stepping stone to evangelize China was a deciding factor. In fact, as Bishop Salazar emphasized to King Philip, for the glory to God, if we could convert a million souls in China, and carry out one of the greatest conversions the world has seen from the time of the early church. The Spanish Empire, in fact, want to propagate Christianity to the whole world. And China, with its ancient culture and millions of souls, was most coveted. The Chinese in the Philippines, therefore, played an important role in the propagation of faith and the crucial learning of uh, Chinese language was imperative at that time. So um, an article by Henning Clotter emphasized that the efforts of the Dominicans to learn Chinese in the Philippines was earlier than the Jesuits learning it in China. The Jesuits like Matteo Ricci, Cataneo, um, Michel Ruggieri and others. So uh, this is uh, a paradigm shift uh, presenting another, another view that maybe they really learn Chinese first. But for us in the Philippines, we knew that it was the, not the Chinese that was known at the time because what they learned at the beginning was Hokkien, our lingua franca in the Philippines. So it is not a coincidence um, that the first three books published in the Philippines three are in Spanish and Chinese, okay? Uh, two were in Spanish and Chinese, the Doctrina Cristiana and Lengua China, and then the Sulu or Apologia de la Verdadera Religion. The Sulu, of course, documented the arguments of the Dominican 
Fryer and the Chinese philosopher about existence of life, what is true religion. Uh, for details about the books, maybe you can just read uh, my paper. Uh, in spite, while well, most of the early Chinese who came to the Philippines were illiterate peasants, I was surprised to discover how the Chinese literate ones were even able to help in the translation work. Father Juan Gobo praised that though the Chinese in Manila come from humble backgrounds, um, only 10 in a thousand did not know a lot of characters. He said, contrast that with his uh, homeland in Castile, it is difficult to find 10 among a thousand who know letters. That's really a tribute to the early Chinese here. To Father Juan Cobo and Father Martin de Rada should be attributed efforts to gather books from China to be brought to the Philippines for them to learn Chinese and to carry out their missions in Fujian. Some of the books translated into Spanish with the help of the long-term Fujianist uh, residents here were used by Mendoza as sources for his book on the Chinese empire. So the Philippines, in fact, is a source of European knowledge about China. Next to Marco Polo's uh, reports, this book, History of the Chinese Empire by Juan Mendoza, published in 1585, is the most important work about China introduced to the West. It was translated into Latin, Italian, English, French, German, Portuguese, Dutch, and unprecedented 46 editions. But Mendoza, used the works of Domingo de Salazar and reports on the Sangris as his resource materials. And most importantly, books brought by Martin de Rada to Manila to complete his work. So we can conclude the Philippines really is an important source of European knowledge about China. A lot of these Chinese materials are found in the USD archives. And Professor Regalado Trota Jose's uh, work uh, is most important. The next slides were borrowed from his PowerPoint with permission. An example of some of the Chinese materials in the Dominican archives hosted at the UST. Okay, example, uh, this book, Religious Persecution and the Five Dominican Martyrs in Fujian. Um, then another example will be um, uh, Francisco Diaz, Diccionario de Lengua Mandarina, revised and expanded by Antonio uh, Diaz uh, at the end. No? A copy of this um, uh, vocabulario, probably produced 1638, is now in the Vatican uh, uh, Library. One of the most significant recent finds are the three volumes, Dictionario Hispanico Sinicum, uncovered by researchers uh, from National Tsinghua University of Taiwan in collaboration with Professor Jose, the USD archivist. The three volumes are labeled not of significance. That's why it waited until research on Chinese materials was conducted by the Tsinghua University and it was launched in 2019 in a book fair. So the, this slide covers the content of Professor Jose's presentation when they launched the beautifully reprinted three volumes of the dictionary. It's a very thick, uh, uh, the set is a, one whole set like that, very thick, the three volumes. Uh, we have uh, the copies at our Kaisa Library, Chindensi Memorial Library, okay? Another dictionary in the UST archives, uh, Lengua Española y China. And then um, this is another, uh, the Catechismo and Lengua Chinchea. This is Zhuangzhou, uh, 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 Zhangzhou, Zhangzhou uh, dictionary. Okay. So uh, this one is an undated document with Christian symbols. You see the cross there, Christian symbols. It reads like uh, a prayer. So it ends with, with several places, amen, amen, amen. So you see, uh, amen, amen, amen. Um, so uh, it's um, another of the, uh, very, uh, the undated early Chinese documents of the USD archives. So, 
six of the first books published in the Philippines, aside from the three that I mentioned, the first three, two, two were in Spanish and Chinese, and they were all published in 1593. But after those three, three there were other books. I mentioned Sulu, I mentioned Doctrina Christiana. Then there's the uh, Mingxin Paojian, Mingxin Po Kam. There's the general ordina uh, ordinances, the Hispanico Sinicum, which I uh, presented, then the Chiu Chiu, uh, uh, Lengua Chiu Chiu, the dictionary. I've, I've shown samples of this. But let me uh, talk about the, the first three books. Huh? Uh, I've talked about the Sulu, of course, and Doctrina Christiana. So let me uh, introduce to you the Mingxin Paojian, Libro Chino or being simple come in, uh, in uh, Hokkien. No? Uh, it's uh, written by Fan Lipen. The, it's the first Chinese book ever translated into a European read uh, Spanish language by the 16th century Dominican friar at Manila Sparian by Father Juan Tobo. So with, with the uh, Doctrina Cristiana and Lengua China and Sulu, these publications are proofs of the close historical relationship between Spain, China, and the Philippines. So the manuscript, the Mingxin Paojian, Mingxin Paokam, was uh, brought actually uh, by Father Juan Miguel de Benavides to uh, be given to Felipe II in 1595. And his uh, foreword when he handed the uh, manuscript was that the Chinese take to their great and true wealth, not gold, nor silver, nor silk, but books, wisdoms, virtues, and just government. What a high praise indeed for early Chinese civilization. So uh, to move to the fourth topic, the missionaries, the, the three first in the Philippines, we, we know about Lorenzo Ruiz, Mother Ignacia, so I will not uh, elaborate anymore on them, but um, let me introduce to you Bishop Luo Wenzhou, the first bishop, uh, the first Chinese bishop uh, in the Philippines. Um, he was not only the first uh, in the Ch in China, the first bishop in China. He was not only the only first bishop in China, but he was the only bishop until the early 20th century. Nobody followed him until the early 20th century. His life was an enlightening story of persecution, sacrifice, and suffering, which reflected the success and efforts of evangelization when Chinese Christian converts hid and protected him at extreme danger to their old lives. It showed how closely linked China and the Philippines were in the spread of Christianity. Since Luo Wenzhou was Chinese, he was the only one who could move around uh, during the peak of Christian persecution. So uh, Luo Wen, that's Bishop uh, Luo Wenzhou. Okay. China's depiction of Christianity, the religious organization of the Catholic Church, is clearly based on information gathered here uh, in the Manila's Chinatown by Fulchinese sojourners. So uh, Dominican missionaries at that time were selected only after they spent several years in pastoral work in the Philippines. So they have a practicum here in the Philippines in the parishes of Parian or Binondo or serving in the Chinese hospital of San Gabriel. So until the 1630s, the Chinese mission of Manila was the only training ground for China-bound friars who learned firsthand about the Chinese people. So the, the fifth section of my paper is the stories of faith, sacrifices, and martyrdom. Uh, I said, we know about Lorenzo Ruiz, but we know, uh, we don't know very much about Feng Suning, Kuo Pang Yong, Luo Wen Zhao, and the other 21 Jesuit priests uh, who went to China. So these stories of faith and sacrifices and martyrdom uh, of the Chinese missionaries trained in the Philippines should form part of our national narrative as we uh, celebrate uh, 500 years of Christianity. We, we know about Lorenzo Ruiz, but uh, uh, an example that we 
that we don't really know very well what the function means. In 1747, actually it started in 1746, the cruel uh, persecution of the Catholics in Fosan, in Fuan, Fosan, China, started. So uh, Juan, uh, Juan was in the Philippines and he was asked not to travel to Fuan anymore. But he still did. He documented the torture and beheading of the five Dominicans and gathered their great their relics at great risk to himself. And then he kept them in secure places. Unfortunately, he was captured in March 1754, imprisoned and sent to exile in the province of Jiangxi. In March 20, 1754, he was escorted by two soldiers and three Christians who wished to accompany him. Feng appeared before 36 tribunes in chains and shackles, suffering from hunger, thirst, and vagaries of extreme weather without any rest or sleep. In March 1755, he arrived at his cramped cell. cell. Loyal witnesses were touched <clears throat> by his display of joy and contentment and willingness to suffer in the home of Jesus Christ. They described that with his eyes transfixed on a rustic crucifix hanging on his prison cell, <coughs> cell wall, Juan Feng Siming succumbed July 1, 1755 to an acute fever exacerbated by fatigue and the debilitating stress of the long journey. Remember, he left in 1754, March, and arrived in only in, uh, <clears throat> died in March, July 1, 1755, a few days after his grueling journey. So this is one example of, um, of the martyrdom and faith. Po Pang Yong is another one. Uh, he followed the Dominican priest in exile to the Philippines, and he's the first Chinese literatus to have lived for a prolonged period inside the Christian environment outside China, and to have received a thorough Christian education in the prior life. Uh, he resided in Bataan here, and he compiled the many, uh, the, the compiled Chinese grammar and the Spanish Chinese uh, dictionary. The chronicler, the Jesse Chronicle Richo, said that uh, Bokin uh, Kopang Yong complied with all the religious duties of the friars as if he were one of them. He became an officiate and a lay leader. Actually, he was one of those who helped uh, 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 Luo Wen Zhao when they would visit the many missions in China, both of them being Chinese. And Kopang Yong is unique because he was a literati. He was um, uh, uh, an school, a scholar of their municipality who could have taken the provincial imperial examination, but he lost his scholarship when they discovered that he was uh, a, a, a Christian and helping uh, in propagating the Christian faith. So there were many stories of sacrifices like this. Okay, so moving now to the religious icons, the vestments, the carvings, and the buildings of stone. So it was not just a story of faith, a story of evangelization, spread of Christianity in China. Here in the Philippines, it was the Chinese who were responsible for building uh, sturdy stone churches like the San Agustin Church. Because there's a transfer of skills and technology was one of the most important contributions of the early Chinese to the Philippines. Stone churches uh, and uh, stone edifices withstood the vagaries of time and weather. They used the abundant indigenous materials as resources and added their technology, the knowledge of using lime, hay, and egg white to bind stones using capitals. Uh, to bring in the light, uh, but not the direct rays of the afternoon sun. So San Agustin Church, with its six pairs of stone lions guarding uh, the patio, it attests to the skills of the Chinese artisans who built the church. If you had been to that, uh, San Agustin Church, you would see the choir, the choir loaf. I don't know if I have it here. I know. The choir loaf with the tiger pose, the chairs with the tiger with the tiger pose, 
and the retablo with Chinese uh, icons that look really very Chinese. So you see that one pair of stone lions, two pairs, then there's, there's one here in, in the patio and another pair there, okay? So many other things like uh, the cobblestones and piedra china of Binondo, uh, leading to Binondo Church, these were uh, Chinese stones, hard stones, um, Qing Shi, uh, brought uh, by the Chinese sampans to bring goods to the Valley of Manila Galleon trade. And these uh, piedra china were used as balas to, to, uh, for the, for the uh, bottom of the sampans. And then you see the, the, uh, this uh, image of the Virgin Mary is one of the earliest European paintings, but rendered by a Chinese painter, combining Chinese style and Western uh, European uh, styles. So this is one of the images called the Kuan Yin Mary. They, they conflated the goddess of mercy, Kuan Yin, and Mama Mary found in our country. There are many more images like that in Santo Domingo Church and, and other, uh, other uh, churches, okay? So these religious icons are hand carved by the Chinese artisans and priest vestments embroidered in gold threads by the Chinese with unmistakable Chinese features. Yeah, you have uh, uh, Kuan Yin Mary there in your Santa Maria Paris in Iloilo, um, one of the Kuan Yin Mary and evidence of the religious syncretism uniquely practiced among the Chinese in the Philippines until now. The last part of my um, uh, presentation here, we'll talk more about the syncretism and how the evangelization, the spread of Christianity evolved and was um, uh, <clears throat> evolved and become a unique syncretic uh, practice by the Chinese Christians here in the Philippines, okay? So skilled artisans carve images like this with unmistakable Chinese imprint. The religious syncretism through time can be seen in the worship of Jesus Nazarene, this one, now the Black Nazarene of Kapalonga in Chinese rites and the worship of Virgin of Kaisasai in Taal Batangas as the goddess uh, Ma Matu um, I have an entire lecture about this uh, given, introduced before, uh, which uh, was based on a joint paper I co-authored with Father Aristotle D. Uh, if you're interested, you can ask him for, the, for that uh, full pa paper that we uh, presented in the University of Hong Kong before. Okay. So moving to the present times, um, to connect the 500 years of Christianity to today, I presented this in one of my talks to you before that 83.7% uh, uh, of the Chinese in the Philippines believe in Christianity. Uh, this was uh, about 92% before. It became lower in 2016, I believe, because some of my respondents were already the new Chinese immigrants. The number of Buddhists also rose to 9.34% from the early, I think about 7.8%. Uh, so this is uh, uh, the, the survey of how many Christians are there now. But the figures can be misleading, as I said, because Chinese Catholics often practice not just Christian rites, but also a mixture of Buddhist, Taoist, and folk tradition together in one event or separately. Sometimes it is difficult to delineate if the beliefs are cults, superstitions, myth, religion, or a mixture of all. But most important uh, from the conclusion of Father Ari's uh, book, tradition, thought practices, faith, and religion, they should not compete, but they can coexist. These are the first two, Confucianism, the belief in the Confucian philosophy and Christianity. So this um, leads to my uh, next few slides, about uh, 10, 10 of them left uh, on religious syncretism before I move to the conclusion, okay? The seventh section of my paper is the religious syncretism like this. The um, Santo Cristo de Longos, uh, this is 
is in the wall of the uh, supermarket in Ongpin Street. Okay. Uh, well, 90% of the Chinois are now Christians, uh, either Catholic, Protestant, or native Philippine uh, churches, and only 9% profess to, to believe in Buddhism or only any form of uh, Chinese folk tradition. There's also a, co a combination of um, faith, folk beliefs, and tradition that becomes a part of the Christian religion that is being practiced here in the Philippines. In a pluralistic Philippine society, Catholic masses and Buddhist rites in one event is not an isolated practice. Example is this one, the funeral mass officiated by his eminence, Cardinal Gaudencio uh, Rosales uh, for past president Corazon Cojanco Aquino. We were the ones who brought the whole Chinese Filipino community and some uh, Chinese students to pay our last respects to Cory Aquino in uh, Chinese rites in August of 2009. And we were, um, we were allowed to do that by the Manila Cathedral. Of course, they asked us first what we will be doing. And uh, we, we told them that it's just the three bows and then the, the incense that will be offered. Okay. Uh, you have here, uh, I think the people in Iloilo are very familiar, San Maria are very familiar with this, and Mary the Queen, where the Catholic priests say hi mass and offer the incense to venerate the ancestors on Chinese New Year's. Okay, uh, I would like to mention that the, <clears throat> the words ancestor worship and filial piety are Western nomenclature. So it can be misleading because it evokes images that this is a religious cult to worship ancestors, but it is not. It is more a practice of respecting or paying respects to our ancestors. Just as Catholics offer candles and flowers, we can offer incense to our dead Chinese ancestors as a sign of respect to them, okay? So syncretism, is a simul, uh, there are different forms. One is the simul, simultaneous practice of elements from different religious traditions. Second <clears throat> is venerating deities of different religions on the same altar or in the same place of worship, just like the Virgen de Caizasai. The third is carrying out Catholic devotions using Chinese ritual styles or matching deities from different religion with one another and treating them similarly, like the, the goddess Matsu, goddess of mercy, and Mama Mary uh, combined and worship as one. So this is a combination of Christian and Chinese rituals of marking high points of, of life, life um, events like birth, death, especially, and it, um, weddings and the like. The Song Hok Tong in the Chinese cemetery uh, is a very, visual uh, <clears throat> is a very uh, visual uh, image of the syncretism because you have one altar with the Chinese, you have the Kwan Kong there, you have the Buddha, then you have Virgin Mary, you have the cross with the cross of crucifixion at the back, the black nerves necessarily at the back. So, and then there are a lot of similarities, for example, um, in uh, Confucian analects, we say shi hai, uh, shi hai yi jia, or shi, shi hai zi ne jie song chong di. So in Christianity, we say we are all brothers under one God. Or the Confucian analects say what you do not, what you yourself do not want, do not impose on others. But the Christian Bible says do unto others what you want others to do unto you. So there's a conflation of this belief that uh, as Father, Father Ari said, should not compete but coexist, okay? Uh, this is the Santo Cristo de Longos. Um, see, Father Ari should gave me this picture to show that there is now a two tikong there. But actually I've seen this several times. I don't know if they remove this from time to time, but uh, the, in occasions where I pass by, I do see this two tikong uh, and incense burner in front of that Santo Cristo de Longos. Okay. 
Then the Kuan Yin Mary, of course, Taoism has absorbed Mary, Santo Nino, and many um, Buddhist figures and gave them new names. So Kuan Yin can be Kuan Yin Fusha, but in Taoism or uh, folk tradition, this is, he is Kuan Yin Ma, okay? So Nuestra Senora del Rosario in the Santo Domingo Church is also Virgin Mary, and this is one of those we call Kuan Yin Mary. Santa Maria Paris, this is the Santa Maria Paris, Our Lady of China, Spanian Mary, worship uh, in the Ilo, Ilo City, Filipino Chinese Paris. Okay. Um, so le let me introduce now Our Lady of Kaisasai, or the, or this is uh, the Batangas people call them the Mama Macho, Mama Macho. Uh, ma Mato New, we call that in uh, Hokkien, but in the Filipinos in Batangas call that uh, Mama uh, Mato, okay? Uh, one of those, uh, Mama Mary, and uh, is Nuestra Señora del Buen Viaje in Antipolo, uh, but worshipped by the Chinese also in Chinese style. Then the Lady of Paisasai in Batangas and in San Fernando, La Union, and then the Nuestra Señora de los Desamparados or Virgen, Virgen del Pozo in the Santo Nino, uh, in the uh, Santa Ana Church. No? All three of these were are related to water. This is a paper uh, uh, from the paper of Father Aridi. Okay, so the Catholic and Chinese deities worship together. The best example would be uh, Shianto Lauma, that is the ma ma Mato, okay, worship. Uh, this is the probably the only image worship as Catholic, Buddhist, and Taoist at the same time. Because Mato is Taoist, Kuan uh, Yin Buddhist, and then Catholic is Mama Mary. Okay. Um, so wait, uh, this this uh, uh, de Kaisasai and worship of Mato and Mary together is now in the temple in Batanga City. And a huge one, very elaborate temple in La Union, uh, in San Fernando, La Union. And there is now in 2018, I think they they uh, delayed a bit a new Mato temple being proposed in Manila. But this one in Manila do not believe in syncretism. This is uh, I, by one of the new uh, new immigrants in even in in China uh, in from China to the Philippines and uh, she's building a new temple in Pinondo. Okay, this is the one in Batangas and almost through. So this is the one the Antipol de Buen Viaje, the the shrine of Our Lady of Peace and Good Voyage, protector of seafarers, just like the Matsu. Uh, the Ornamato is a protector of uh, uh, seafarers, okay? Um, uh, this is a very elaborate uh, temple in uh, La Union. The origin of the devotees is the Lady Sakaisasai in Batangas, and then they called it the Fenxiang, the, the, uh, the, the Mato was the one who requested the Chinese uh, for them to build a temple in San Fernando, La Union, okay? So in September, the Batangas people will go in a procession uh, in a long, long uh, travel from Batangas to La Union. And then in November, um, the Batangas will, will uh, go to La Union. Now in September, the La Union people will go to Batangas and meet uh, Kaisasai, the Lady of Kaisasai in September. And then uh, the other way around, the La Union people, the, the Batangas people the, will then go to La Union in November. Okay. Um, the, these were consecrated, both Mato in Batangas and La Union were actually consecrated by the Mother Temple in the birth, birthplace of the Queen of Heaven in Meizhou, Fujian, uh, Fujian, the birthplace of Ma, uh, Mazo Niu. Okay, so is this accepted by the Catholics? 
Yes, because even Pope Pius himself designated Matzo as one of the seven manifestations of Virgin Mary. This includes Lady of Guadalupe, Lady of Her Holy Rosary in Manawag, of uh, Peña Francia de Naga, Peace and Good uh, Voyage in Antipolo, Holy Rosary of Pia, and Our Lady of Fatima. So now Matzo is included as uh, one of the manifestations of, um, of uh, the Virgin Mary. So this helped to intensify the belief in Mazo, especially since word of mouth attests that all wishes requested of her are granted. So the, uh, the other one uh, that I showed you would be the Black Nazarene of Kapalonga, where they offer food, incense, and divination. So um, I don't have theological or um, uh, theoretical explanations uh, on or a rigorous examination on this kind of syncretic uh, faith. But I would like to believe that these stories and legends, after rigorous examination and perpetration, would be the same as our rigorous examination of the many um, miracles that have happened uh, uh, among the Catholic saints, for example, even Lorenzo Ruiz and these things. So some folk believes in the Philippines like dancing during fiestas, offering eggs uh, to request for babies when they want to have babies, uh, having harvest festivals, fluvial parades, these uh, Filipino folk traditions are the same as the Chinese folk traditions that became part of Christian faith and religion. So these practices that preach the achievement of enlightenment for the good of mankind can coexist and not be a competition with one another. So I'm, I have about three more minutes left, okay? So what were the key lessons that we learned from this um, nearly 40 minutes presentation. Number one, the early Chinese served the colonial economy, not just uh, through the provision of essential services to make lives easier, but to be the bridge in evangelizing China. Of course, you know how they became the carpenters, the artisans, the carvers in ivory, uh, the builders of stone buildings. But uh, the, the essential services made life easier as well as help in evangelizing China uh, through uh, their knowledge of Chinese and help in translation of the Chinese catechisms. So, well, most of the Chinese, early Chinese were illiterate. Among them were literati who helped in the translation of catechisms and religious tracts and produced the early dictionaries used by the missionaries to propagate religion in China. So number three, not all Chinese who were baptized did so for convenience or expediency as many of our history lessons told us. Among them were shining examples of deep faith like Lorenzo Ruiz, Mother Ignacia, and the early Christian Chinese missionaries trained in the Philippines. The quality of indoctrination and conversion is such that the converted literally died for their faith and glorify, and they glorified God before they succumbed to their ill fate. Um, remember the story of faith and the martyrdom that I shared. Uh, there were stories about um, the women uh, who were persecuted because, because they defied the, the Confucian tradition of getting married. They stayed virgins, they stayed chaste like the Virgin Mary, and they be, because they wanted, uh, they, they became the equivalent of nuns at the time when there were still no uh, nunnery or um, there, were, there was still no uh, space for women before. But the, the the reports of the, the Fujian uh, pre prefectures there to the emperor <clears throat> really castigated these women 
and men for defying the um, Confucian teaching of the unity and harmony of the family because they refused to get married. So there were a lot of these stories of true conversions um, in the early days of Christian nations in China. So the fourth lesson will be the Chinese folk traditions and ways of worshiping merge which is Christian practices are indelible, indelible parts of the history of Christianity in the Philippines. And this is the story of this story of the Christian faith as practiced by the ethnic Chinese should be written as part of the narrative of 500 years of Christianity that started with the Spanish colonization but continued on until today in its many forms and practices. So thank you very much. That ends my slideshow. Thank you very much.